All right, well, welcome everyone um, to our second live session of today. For those of you who maybe weren't at our first session or you're watching this recording, um, it is April 18th, 2020. I think every day is gonna, or every hour is gonna feel like another day. So I keep reminding myself. Uh, we've been saying for a while, it feels a little bit like Groundhog's Day anyway with what we are all dealing with in this moment. But uh, we talked a little bit in the first session about this, and I just want to reiterate that, that this particular Global Stress Summit, this is the fourth year. Many of our contributors, including Dr. Stephen Porges, have been with us before. So this is not a new conversation talking about stress and stress mastery and um, all of the great things we're going to talk about in this next hour, which I'm just so excited about, you all know that. Um, but this is something that we have needed to talk about for a long time that is more of a focus right now. And we can be grateful that we have these amazing experts to talk to and learn from. And so many of them are taking this deeper, really integrative neuroscience concepts that is so complex and fascinating, but making it really practical for us so that we can know what does that mean for me today? to have a healthier, happier day. So I'm gonna just go straight into this conversation. Um, if for some reason you haven't heard of my next guest, Dr. Stephen Porges, you're gonna be so glad that you did now. Uh, similar to our friend, Bruce McEwen, who unfor unfortunately passed away this year, he has such a wealth of information, has published so many studies and continues to do great work. He also does a lot of interviews and lectures that you can find actually on YouTube. He's one of the ones where I'll just go randomly. I'm going out for a walk and listening to Dr. Porges today because it always, even if I've listened to it before, I always find it so inspiring and so applicable. And I also want to say before we start, uh, Dr. Porges, that your wife, um, Dr. Sue Carter, also has some amazing lectures and information. She really specializes in oxytocin and social bonding. And you know, when you hear all of this weave together, it's really quite beautiful. So uh, let me just start by saying on behalf of all of us who are here, thank you so much for joining us and joining us live. And maybe you can let everyone know where you're at right now in this moment. <laughs> at, at this way, anyway, thank you so much for inviting me. It's gonna be a pleasure to interact again, even in this virtual world. You know, the, the dialogue that we're in now is we're all self-quarantined. And the issue is if you have to hunker down, where would you want to be? Right. And fortunately, and this is where you wake up in the morning with a sense of gratitude that you're uh, self-quarantined, but you're on a house oceanfront in, in the northern part of Florida where the weather's mild and you go sit on the porch and there are birds and you hear the ocean. Yeah. So if you have to be anywhere, you want to be with the person that you care about and you want to be in a physical place where you look out and you feel comfortable. And in a very interesting way that when you're near the ocean and the activity of the ocean, you don't feel alone. It's kind of a very interesting feeling of connectedness occurring even in that unusual uh, space. I can't believe you just said that. Everyone who's here listening probably thinks that I teed him up for that. I did not. I didn't mention that. Oh. <laughs> You're going to get such a kick out of this. And this is another one we'll take offline to have a deeper discussion about. But um, I'm actually in the process of moving. So I've lived for 11 years in a high rise condo downtown San Diego. And the nice thing is it was close to the airport. So for as much as I traveled, it was helpful. Mm -hmm. But the noise, I'm by a train station, an airport, the military. I mean, there's a lot going on downtown San Diego, which is exciting. But for someone who's highly sensitive and stress sensitive and has vasovagal syndrome, it's, um, it's a little too much, especially when you have to be hunkered down. So a couple of weeks ago, I had a difficult situation and I just decided it's time to leave. We actually are at my mom's place that's on the ground and wasn't being used at the moment. And we're moving in two weeks to the beach. And I said, I don't care what we have to do to make this work, but... Mm. I need the sound of the ocean and I need to see the ocean. And so to hear you say that now, it makes so much sense to me. There's, there's even more because where we live, there's still a lot of vegetation. There are palm trees, there's a magnolia tree in the back and a live oak. So you see there's a lot of green stuff is what I call it behind yeah. the house as the green stuff goes over the dune and then there's the ocean. So from our house to the ocean, there is nothing except 
our property. Mm -hmm. And we hear the birds in the morning. So you watch the, uh, especially the cardinals as they are going into their mating routine now. And it's quite remarkable. So where you would be stressed by the noise of traffic, the sounds of birds communicating in different species talking is really quite relaxing. And so is the ocean. So our body responds. So this actually can be kind of a segue into yeah. uh, a concept that I use, which is this concept that I call neuroception, which is our nervous system's evaluation of the cues in the environment as being safe, dangerous, or life-threatening. And it's not loudness, it's patterning of sound that's critical. So the patterning of a bird calling to another bird is relaxing. Mm -hmm. The pattern of a jackhammer going into concrete is not relaxing. And so our nervous system is not merely responding to the amount of energy, meaning the loudness, but the pattern of that energy, which is really social communication, cues of safety, cues yeah. that make us feel good. And in a sense, our body's always telling us what we like to hear, what we like to feel, who we like to see, and how we like to interact. And mm -hmm. uh, actually, we'll cut to the chase because there's a silver lining to the COVID-19 crisis. And that is, like other aspects of trauma, it tells us what's important in life because when we lose it, we understand its value. So when people suffer from severe trauma, they desire to be in the arms of another, but going into the arms of another become cues of threat and danger and their body recoils. So they have difficulty reestablishing safe, trusting relationships. So with COVID-19, our bodies are in states of threat and we're also being removed from social interaction. Right. And what we start realizing is that through the democratization of threat, we start understanding what it's a, what's a value in being a human. And the value is our social connectedness with another or others. And we have to find portals to do that because our body's screaming to reach out and give someone a hug. And we're left with the two dimensional screen, which we want to give a virtual hug, but now we have to be present with that person in virtual space. And that is what we have to learn to do. So we're screaming to co-regulate and the tools that we have are the tools that we're using at this moment, which is really kind of unique in the history of humanity, that we have the opportunity to be relatively synchronous. Our timing is really quite close mm -hmm. and we can make relatively reasonable eye contact if I look into the camera. Mm -hmm. So we can share that moment. And what I tried to explain recently, I started getting into try understanding what's going on as I am attempting to retune my nervous system, retune yeah. how I respond to two dimensions, because what's the history of two dimensional screens in our lives? Ignore them, their entertainment. And if we move them into our work environment, it's just for information. But now it's much more than information. It's being present with someone else. So what I start doing is when I'm doing a, I don't normally re wear glasses. And these are readers uh, I, that I'll put on for the computer screen. But if I put them on, I can see greater definition in your face. Mm -hmm. I can see, in a sense, more micro movements. I become more uh, responsive to you because I see you more. It's as if I were seated, seated across from a table. I'd be picking up these cues intuitively. And now I'm learning to retune my nervous system. To respond I to find it. myself leaning toward. I never sit this close to a monitor because it's so come stimulating. On, but I like can't get close. <laughs> come on, yeah, you know, it's a portal. It's one of those uh, Twilight Zone yeah. shows. You know, just come on in. We're and we, in a sense, have to start seeing the virtual world in ways that it triggers our real world mm -hmm. because the world of social interaction is really going to be different for a relatively, let's say. Uh, potentially a year until a vaccine is developed. Yeah. So we need to allow our bodies to feel safe and connected without putting our bodies in risk and giving it mixed signals. Mm. So beautiful. And so many things you just touched on. Right now, outside of my window, there is construction. So now I'm on the ground, which feels better. Yeah. But the 
definitely not rhythmic pattern outside is very chaotic. And so one of the things I like to remind people of is that when we're having to rebalance our own nervous system is that it's, it can be exhausting. So the day today will be more tiring for me than it may have been in a quiet mm -hmm. space or not staring at a screen. Mm -hmm. And to honor that side of us that needs to recharge adequately to shift back into balance. Yeah, your body is telling you that. Yeah, it's your job to attend to it. And what we've done through most of our life is to say, oh, my body's telling that, oh, don't worry, I can handle this. Right. I'll do another hour, I'll do another, uh, you know, I can, I can basically not listen to my body, I can inhibit the need to exercise in the morning, I can inhibit the need to just relax and do nothing. Because my brain says I have to go in a direction of completing tasks. It's a model of acquisition. And again, what COVID-19 is telling us is that it doesn't matter what we acquire. We could be extraordinarily wealthy. We could have lots of publications or lots of degrees. Uh, it doesn't really matter. What matters is this opportunity to relate to others, to co-regulate with other human beings. Mm. And in some cases, other appropriate mammals. Some people do real well with their dogs, right. but we don't have a dog here. So, it's, and I miss the dogs that I've had. And you know, we're in a a, a dogless period, and it, it, I kind of I miss the animals. It's funny because people are in chat right now, and I have to let you know this is so funny. I, I made a comment that a couple of days ago. So I'm saying in a, in a community where my mom lives, um, when she's not in Idaho, she's in Idaho right now. And it's a suburban San Diego. And I went for my normal walk and all of a sudden it kind of smelled like barnyard animals. And I looked <laughs> at my left and there were literally hundreds of these goats. I was so confused. I got on Facebook Live and I was like, does anyone know what these goats are? Well, it turns out in this neighborhood, and it's called Del Sur, they use the goats to actually eat the brush near the homes as a fire hazard oh. protection. I'd never heard of this. So people know that I went back to see the goats because I was so excited because mm -hmm. I don't have pets, but I love animals. So I go mm -hmm. to the zoo a lot and I'm you know, drawn to animals. So I was so excited. Anyway, I went to see the goats. They weren't there. So I was bummed. Well, then yesterday I was walking in a different part of the community and I look across and see hundreds of goats. So people have said they're looking forward to hearing from me about my meditation with goats. So <laughs> it ties in as well. And I want to emphasize something you said and, and, and make sure this lands with everybody. This concept of neuroception that mm -hmm. you taught me several years ago mm -hmm. has totally changed the lens through which I see everything about my life. And in fact, I know I've shared this with you, but the whole brain recharge process I teach people, mostly in corporations, but now we're doing with college students as well, is what I call neuroception meditation, but I don't want anyone to get like consumed with the, the concept, but essentially it's how do you meditate in a way through breathing, feeling positive emotion, and then focusing on an intention that recharges the brain and the nervous system in this intentional way. And that was really based on this neuroception concept. So thank you. Thank you, and I'm pleased you're using the idea. In, in a way, it's saying, can I learn from my body without telling my body what to do? Yes. And what it ends up doing is taking away that veneer of, uh, uh, of hypervigilance of, on your body and responsibility. And now let's say, be who you are, let's see who you are. And for me, I don't do it in the same way that you're talking about meditation. Uh, I do it in a sense in terms of a body scanning. I start to feel where my body is and what it's doing. And remember, so much of our life has been about turning off those cues and becoming numb. Yes. And we need to, in a sense, appreciate our feelings. Uh, I start to think about what was it that polyvagal theory brought to the clinical world? And I came up with kind of a phrase and basically said it shifted the personal or human narrative from a documentary of events to a documentary of feelings. Mm, beautiful. So, be, so it, just think about what we do, including even in the world of trauma and stress, we are articulating what the events are. Yeah. And in doing that, we are not respecting the individual's reaction to them. So if someone uh, deals with a very stressful situation or you deal well with it and someone else doesn't, 
immediately that person who doesn't feel that they've done something wrong, they right. are incompetent. And the irony of all this, the way that we react doesn't mean we'll react the same way the next time. So it's all dependent upon the autonomic state that we're in at the time that we are challenged. And with COVID-19, what we're learning is that individuals who are uh, sequestered, their reaction to the virus or the threat of the virus is really a function of their subjective uh, interpretation of their bodily state. If they, if they uh, react or if they, uh, th this is truly a perception, if they think that their body is in a state of reactivity, they're doing very poorly with the, with the threat. If they feel their body is more relaxed or more socially engaged, it's not being manifested in heart or sweat or digestive problems. Those people are doing fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you talk about this idea of threat, I want to bring this down to, again, a really practical perspective. And something I've heard you say that, again, gave me a whole new lens through which to see this is I think sometimes we think about threat or trauma as what I call capital T. Something happens and it's traumatic. The earthquake or even COVID, which is interesting because it is it is a threat. Mm. It's typically more short-term. It feels more long-term because of the circumstances. But you, know, you shared something once and it was actually in one of your lectures and we're gonna post links to a bunch of those for everybody. But it was in a room where the lights were really dark. Oh. I love this so much because I have been advocating for this for a long time, especially teaching online. Mm -hmm. When you're teaching a course online, and I have two very different experiences right now, one as a teacher, one as a student, one of which every student is on camera and engaged, mm -hmm. and the other one where half or more is just a blank screen with a name on it. Mm -hmm. So essentially, you looked out into the audience, and it was very dark, and you stopped what you were doing and actually asked them to lift the light. So can you explain to people why? I will, because it was, it was a meeting on compassion. Mm -hmm. so I really want to get into the paradox. It yeah. was in this beautiful place in Telluride, Colorado, and I was just... I mean, I couldn't give a talk if I don't see it bouncing off of a person because right. why am I giving the talks? I'm giving the talks as a way of communicating with other. And so you know that your talks are effective if you can see it reflected in other people. Right. So, so that I was just really, uh, it was that moment and saying, how can you do this to me while I'm up here? <laughs> to, uh, opening up and becoming accessible and vulnerable. Absolutely. How can you take away my regulation. That's really what I was saying to them. Absolutely. And you are calling this a meeting on compassion. That was the backstory. I say, basically understand what compassion is. Yeah. It's the ability to respect the other person's state. Yeah, and, and I think what I want everyone to understand and, and how this landed for me in the context of everything you're sharing is that a, not seeing a face is a potential threat because you're not getting that information. So one is you're not getting the feedback to know if your content is landing, mm -hmm. but especially if you have a negativity bias and, and Dr. Gordon and I were just talking about this in the previous session, your brain, and I know mine does this, tends to think, am I boring? Are they mm -hmm. yawning? You know, what else could they be doing? And that is actually a threat. Yeah. I see. I reframe the whole thing and I call it biological rudeness. So what you're really describing is when someone turns their head away or their face goes flat. Now, a yeah. close friend of mine, Ed Tronic, developed the still face paradigm. Mm, yeah. Infants, and that is, that's as simple as the mother just creates a flat face. She doesn't express anything. Yeah. And the children, uh, these are infants about six to 12 months of age. They basically go ballistic because initially they kind of, they reach out to try to help the uh, mother or the experimenter regulate their state because they see a, uh, a breakdown in that person's ability to self-regulate. And then the individual uh, baby will turn away and start crying or become agitated. And then in two minutes, which is that's all the manipulation is, the person or the mother in this case will engage the child. Everything's fine. Yeah. It tells us a couple of important things. It tells us that our body is looking for certain cues and those cues are facial expressivity and intonation of voice. Mm -hmm. Second, it tells us we are easily uh, triggered by this being taken away, but we're also easily, it's also easily repaired. I was just gonna ask you, because I know everyone's dying to know as I am, can we 
Oh, easy. this is this is the. It's almost like saying disruptions are great because they provide opportunities for repair. Yeah. And, and you know, as an academic, I the, the scenario that I always like to describe is about the graduate student or the assistant professor uh, going up to a, a senior professor who just walks right by them. Yeah. And and everyone says, oh, it's guess it's because I'm not important. No one really reflects on the fact that the senior professor may have many of the attributes of being on autistic spectrum. Yes. And because in academics, that's who I'm going to say that's who we tend to be. Yes. Because we love to regulate our state through object or through our idea and not necessarily with people. So it takes time to understand that your culture can support a asociality when your nervous system needs sociality to maintain uh, better homeostatic states and, and support health growth and restoration. I'm so glad my husband's listening to this now because I know a light bulb just went off for him the same way it went for me on, oh, I'm using ideas and concepts to regulate my nervous system. I never thought about that before. So. One of the questions that came up, uh, and I just saw a comment from my dear friend, Dr. Stephanie Peabody. So I'm just gonna give her a high five. And uh, she is the one leading this charge with the Brain Health Initiative in Florida. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. But um, <clears throat> is when there is some trauma, uh, one of the questions that came up we weren't able to get to last time was how much can we rewire or reshape the brain and nervous system once we're an adult? Let's say something happened when we were younger. So let me kind of recast that in a different way because polyvagal theory lives in a world of optimism. It starts there. Let's That's start. a good start. <laughs> and basically it's saying that it's not rewiring, it's not neuroplasticity, it's shifting state. Mm. So it's really saying that we have these very, very global adaptive states and they evolve to support our survival. The problem is that when we are severely traumatized and go through a life threat response, it's very hard for the nervous system to feel safe and trusting of another person. And this is where therapy comes in and therapy comes in through, in polyvagal terms, through neural exercises in which cues of safety enable brief windows of the body feeling safe and then through therapy, there's a titration and a regulation of this. And what many people are finding is that many of the therapies that are more beneficial in the world of trauma are somatic oriented. Right. So and for I, people who may not know that term, somatic oriented, can you? Body, body therapists. You know, so somatic therapists, body therapists, body, there, there are a yeah. lot of people. So yeah. I, I created the Traumatic Stress Research uh, consortium. Yeah. And if there are trauma therapists on board watching this, please sign up and just send an email to trauma at indiana.edu. Wonderful. And they will send you materials. Now, what we learned in our initial survey of trauma therapists is we start to learn that most trauma therapists were trained in eight different subspecialties. You know, they would go in and get certification in many things. So a trauma-informed therapist often has a toolkit that's quite broad. But what's also interesting is that they start to uh, de uh, describe what types of therapies were more beneficial and which types of therapies they were using. So we were able to create a plot in where more beneficial was to the right and more frequently used was higher up. And it's basically a triangle where the ones up in the upper right-hand corner frequently used uh, beneficial ones were very body-oriented. The more cognitively oriented ones went off to the left, meaning they were less effective. It doesn't mean they're not useful, but in the world of trauma, they weren't very helpful for many of the therapists. Yeah. So do you look at all or do you consider in your work um, kind of the, di the difference between, I, I called it capital T, lower T, but like trauma where it's circumstantial, more short term versus developmental trauma over time? Okay. So um, the, the answer, my response is a little going to be complex mm. uh, because I, I'm really focusing on the physiological state. So it can be that certain uh, small T's 
can be big T's for yeah. some people. But when we start talking about uh, developmental traumas, we're talking not solely uh, about an accumulation of, of abuse and, and traumatic experience. We're talking about a retuning of a nervous system, a learning, mm. a learning that cues of safety are not cues of safety. The cues of safety are cues of vulnerability. And that to me becomes the most interesting information that I've learned in the past few years. Because yeah. uh, I had, in a sense, optimistically believed that you could give cues of safety to a severely traumatized person and their bodies would now become accessible. Mm -hmm. But their bodies were smarter than I was because yeah. their bodies might start to do that and then come back because they're saying in their neural language, done that before, look what happened. Yes. And I started to learn this with uh, the safe and sound protocol, the acoustic intervention I developed. And the trauma community started to embrace it because they had heard me talk about it. And then we started to get some interesting feedback. And that was, oh, the first uh, hour was just great. I slept the next night, just great. I was totally relaxed. But when I did it the next day, I just, I became destabilized and hyperreactive. And so I started to understand what was happening that the body needed to basically titrate this to take it in small chunks. And then they, the therapist, once they became really trauma-informed, polyvagal-informed, and safe and sound protocol-informed, they start to cleverly develop their protocols to match their own clients, meaning slowly. And uh, the results for, for some of the therapists have been totally remarkable yeah. because they were able to allow their clients to get back into their body. And that's really what's going on. They're feeling this sense of safety that they haven't felt. And if, it, if they're not ready for that, it becomes a cue, a cue of defense. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the insightful things that for me that I've learned is don't think that if you can, that you can make everyone feel safe because what makes a person feel safe if they have a, let's use this term, a repeated abuse trauma history where uh, they have you been in a sense seduced or brought in or believed to trust another person and then have been injured. Their yeah. body w recalls that not with a vivid memory, but almost with a behavioral reaction of saying, been there, not going to do that again. Yeah. And we can see this in the world like we, you know, we're in a sense, well, you're a Californian. Mm -hmm. you, so you give people hugs. And it's very- I'm an introvert, so not a lot, but it happens. Oh, well, yeah. well <laughs> yeah. in a sense, the culture is very superficially yeah. uh, intimate. That's right. Okay, so you give people, people hugs. Have. That's a diagnostic. Mm -hmm. You can see how that person's body. So I always use it as a sense of where I am that day. If I give a hug and my body is conforming, hey, I'm in a good space. If yes. I give a hug and I feel rigidity, I feel my body pulling back, it means that, I'm a little bit overwhelmed. Yeah. And part of what I think you're telling me is you feel that in your body when people come up to you. You're picking that cue that, that, it's, that the culture says be proximal. Your body says this, stay back. Well, and very much so. And so as you're saying this, I know a lot of the people who are watching and, and I want to pause for just a second and say everyone who's joining us for this live, um, don't worry, please don't stress out. He's mentioning a lot of things. I know so far all of them and where to point you in the direction to get more information. I did actually go through the safe and sound protocol okay. as well um, to test it out. And so we'll make sure everyone has the right links to all of that. Um, but you know, what's fascinating about speaking with you every single time is I have this foundation, we've talked before, and then the next time it's like a layer upon a layer, personally and professionally. So yes, in my experience, certainly I understand now more why when I hug, I really coil back, even with the people who are closest to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's a vulnerability thing, mm -hmm. but also something that I know a lot of people who are here are gonna have the same question, is we appreciate the 
individual differences mm -hmm. and kind of the genetics and early experience and all of this, how it plays a role. So within that, have you seen anything about, again, biologically, are there genetic differences that with some of us make us a little bit more highly sensitive to those cues? I, I would start off without going to genes. Of course, there's going yeah. to be a genetic component, but let's put that aside. It's kind of like with illness, people want to create a genetic model of illness and they find out like with, even with certain cancers, it's a few percentage points at best. Right. With autism, they're nowhere even on the table to yeah. say, even though they're assuming it's a genetic disorder, they're not identifying the genes because the conceptualization may be wrong. If the manifestation of features, let's just take autism, is really dependent upon physiological state, then the issue is how do you get that person out of that state? Right. And so if we think about physiological state as having what I call emergent properties, so physiological state in my conceptualization is a neural platform for certain classes or domains of behaviors. So if you feel safe, you're spontaneously socially engaging. If your body's under a type of threat that triggers fight flight behaviors, it pulls back and your muscles are tight. We see this as irritability or anxiety or use metaphors like tightly wrapped people. Mm. If your body goes into shutting down, you don't even see the other person, you're dissociated, you're someplace else. Right. And most people who shut down don't stay there, they go back and forth between highly mobilized, anxious, and then whoosh. So in their interactions, they're actually giving the other person cues of, of a aggressor. So if you're highly anxious, you're pushing into other people's space. And that triggers in the other person a response of being aggressive back. Hmm. And a person with trauma history will then whoosh, go into a, a shutting down and say, why are you, I mean, why? They move from a victim to aggressor to victim because their nervous system is detecting and trying to do a complex dance of survival. If they can feel safe, the social engagement system comes on with much more resilience and range of, of behaving. Uh, as I'm talking, I think there's gonna be a metaphor that will be very useful. If we think of a continuum starting on my far right as being vulner vulnerability and my far left being accessibility, and when we're accessible, we are, in a sense, accept our vulnerabilities and we're regulated. And so what we're always trying to do is navigate across that continuum. But if we carry with us a trauma history, we're very biased to our vulnerabilities. And now when we're dealing with a chronic external ambiguous stressor or threat like COVID-19, people who are in this vulnerable state, meaning many people who carry with them trauma histories, their bodies are reacting in a very adverse way. The virus, is, the threat of the virus is destabilizing them. They're worrying more, they can't regulate. And the primary mitigating uh, mechanism of social interaction, even for people who titrate their social interaction has been removed from them. So, so my dear friend, Monsi just chimed in with a comment I think is so powerful about how this so deeply explains the cycle of domestic violence. Yeah. Oh, and I, I was going to say, even though this is it's so sad, I thank you for bringing it up because we have to understand what's going on with self-quarantining. Mm -hmm. It's not only that couples are, uh, or individuals or partnerships are, are locked into a confined space. We have to acknowledge that many partnerships are not healthy partnerships. Right. Many families are not healthy families. So we're really setting up a situation for severe uh, trauma and trauma histories, especially for children who are put into to these environments. I'm gonna tell you what I'm doing and now I don't have to do it. I didn't wanna look distracted, but I'll be honest, I just was gonna type in the chat box to my husband who is watching how grateful I am to him because he. Uh, I waited till I was 43 to get married. Um, I didn't think anyone could ever tolerate my sensitivity. And I'll tell you to have a true partner who's in this and understands the roller coaster is so life-changing. And it's mm -hmm. funny now that he's sitting in and listening to this because one of the first things we did was actually talk with a friend of mine who is a neuropsychologist about my brain. And, and 
John, thank God, found it fascinating that even the colleague, we've become friends too. He said, look, you're, you're a lucky guy because she's going to be a little all over the place, but no one will be more loving, loyal, compassionate, mm. you know, a fan of yours. And it's true. As the person dealing with that, though, too, I think it's easy to get stuck in the vicious loop of self-criticism when you see your reactionary patterns. So mm. that's one of the questions I want to offer up to you is, I think from a practical perspective, I think we're looking at this twofold. One is as the individual going through that, what can we do to shift our state? And then as the compassionate supporter, whether it's in a, a partnership or as a coach, counselor, you know, anything like that, what can we do? Well, let's first acknowledge that we're all human, okay? Yes. Let's and see. when we make that acknowledgement, we realize that uh, when a, one person destabilized in our presence, our bodies will treat that destabilization as triggers, mm. and especially you know with spouses or partners or friends and children. And we can't, in a sense, we have to be the adult in the room. And compassion, in a way, is a metaphor for being the adult in the room. It's really saying, I see what you're doing. I respect what you're doing but I am not reacting in the way that you're reacting. And I'm not telling you that I'm there to support you. So if I tell you that I'm evaluating you and now my, I'm not compassionate. And we could do that for ourselves and others, right? Like we yeah. could be the adult with the part of our reactionary brain that says, I see what well, you're doing. And <laughs> that part of the, of ourselves in a sense says, okay, my body's reactive. Yeah. But I know what the features are that trigger that reactivity. And I know what my body is really asking for. So I, I use the metaphor of luggage. I take my body and I move it someplace else. So if my body is reactive, I take it to a place where I'm not bouncing off with someone else. Mm. Because my cues that I'll be sending are going to be picked up by that other person's nervous system. And they're going to react as if I am hurting them. And when we get into the world of compassion, we really have to understand that if someone is in pain, the worst thing they would want of you as a supporting human being is to feel their pain. Right. Because that, in a sense, uh, double uh, victimizes the victim again, because someone in pain does not want to hurt someone else. Right. But if the person has this degree, we use the word adult in the room, we're compassionate, and they're, in a sense, respectful, and supportive of the other person experiencing their pain, but not feeling their pain, that will help them get out of it. And this is complicated because that whole the whole world of compassion sciences and becomes all over the place because words like empathy and compassion and sympathy get all confused. Right. And I'm trying to say that we have misunderstood really what compassion really yeah. is but our nervous system hasn't misunderstood it. It really says, when I'm in pain, what do I want from the person next to me? Do I want them to feel my pain? No. Do I want them to be there with me? Yes. I want their presence. Do I want them to fix it, take my pain away? No. I just want them to witness me, respect that I have these feelings, and allow me, with my own competence, to pass through it. So I just have to say again, and then we've got a couple questions I want to ask from the, the group here, how much I adore you as a human. Uh, this what, what a special treat for me to get to have this conversation selfishly, realizing it will help other people as well. So Lynn uh, shared a question here I think is fantastic. I'm just going to read what she wrote. She says, I've referred to the post-virus social connection as a stampede. Do you anticipate a trauma response to those who need social connection at a high intensity versus those who will emerge quietly and maybe not want the stimulation? It's really interesting because what, what uh, she's bringing up is how we adapt. Mm -hmm. And so for some people, and, I, and I've been in contact with lots of colleagues and friends, and some are really enjoying the isolation. They're, it's a reduction of stimulation. Right. Their bodies are doing fine. Yeah. And I'm actually seeing that when I'm saying I have a need to interact, but 
I'm also, it's like we walked on the beach yesterday. It was open for the first time. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, we wave or smile at some people. But, and then we met some people that we, we actually walked from different parts of the beach to meet. It was an hour for each of us to walk in each direction. And after a while, I was just ready to go back, back home. It was like, um, I, I'm going to have to ease into this. So it, it's like our bodies adjust. And I guess that is the most important thing there. People who need to co-regulate, but that adjustment is that they'll start to regulate with objects. So they become more asocial in their lifestyle. So, but those are going to be individual differences. There's mm -hmm. probably going to be a pent up socialization. Uh, but I'm really more concerned about those who have, uh, who are going to respond to the virus due to their earlier histories, yeah. that they're going to lose purpose in life, they're going to have despair and they're going to be withdrawn yeah. or what people would use to call clinically depressed, but their bodies are going to not feel comfortable in the presence of others. Yeah. And that is the group I'm concerned about because that requires now it requires, in a sense, therapy, but it requires a retuning of those nervous systems to allow people in proximity. Mm. And I, I'm really, I, I'm really, I would say there's a compassion part of me, but there's also a scientific curiosity here. Yeah. And that is, I don't know how this is all going to unfold. And it's like we all, I was watching my own body. We have to be our own observers of ourselves. And by around day 10, I was really irritable and wanted to get out. Mm -hmm. And I, I have an electric bike, but I couldn't put it on the beach, which I would have liked to have done. So I went out on it a couple of times. And then our sons told me not to do that. They said, if you fall, you'll end up in the ER. You don't want to end up in the ER now. Yeah. This is the wrong time. So I'm not doing that. But that was the, the, I had to get out. I had to go and see people. I had to move. And that was you know, that was maybe 20 days ago. Now I am kind of like into a routine. Mm -hmm. So use the word Groundhog's Day. I would say uh, every day is the same in a, in a, in a funny way. Uh, I exercise more. I take it on different tasks uh, to regulate my physiology so that I don't have a sense that I have pent up energy. So mm -hmm. I am exercising more than I ever have in my life. I can tell you that. Um, so, and it becomes a routine, which is something yeah. that I never thought I would do because I really don't like exercise that much, but mm -hmm. it's an hour plus every morning I'm doing exercises. So, um, and that in a sense is my get out of jail free, uh, a card because then I feel I can sit on the porch the rest of the right. day and watch the ocean, do email and write. And I can then in a sense be this more, uh, immobile type person without saying, oh, you're, you're going to uh, get osteoporosis. You're going to have all these other complications, cardiovascular. You're not young anymore. If you don't keep moving, I've, I paid my dues for that hour. Now my body can just feel safe and relax. But well, you look fantastic. I actually know. was thinking that at the beginning, you really do. And, and I think it shows that people who can adapt and adjust, um, especially if you are used to one routine. I mean, I was training for a half marathon. I was running every day and, and oftentimes at least an hour and a half, and then mm -hmm. I got sick. So I haven't been able to do that in seven mm -hmm. weeks now. And so it's been a huge adjustment for me to see walking and movement and smaller activity as being enough and really critical. And because I always tell people for me, exercise is more about my brain and my nervous system than it is my body, the way we tend to think about body. Well, l let me re give you a different language. Please. Um, your body's sending signals to your brain. Yeah. yeah. You got to think of it in that way. So it, in a sense, the autonomic nervous system is not merely a neural system controlling those organs. It's also a communication pathway of surveillance of your organs and sending information upstairs. Mm, and it's right. creating uh, accessibility or portals to different parts of your brain. And you need mobilization to send the feedback so that certain portals open up because if they don't open up, it might be reflected in anxieties or uh, tightly wrapped or defensiveness. Mm. 
And so you're really leveraging the feedback of exhaustion or motoric activity as a cue to your system to say, calm down. Right. So the part, there are other toolkits that you might look at, and that is types of breath, types of breathing, because uh, breathing is, is in a sense, it's a, a godsend. It's like if, if you were to design the human autonomic nervous system and said, give me, give me one thing, give me a portal that I can control operatively uh, uh, with my own intentionality to change my physiological state, it would be how I breathe. Absolutely. So you can calm yourself through slower exhalations. So it's actually a manipulation functionally of vagal regulation. You are stimulating vagal activity. You're calming your body down. Mm. So I want to add, uh, and you know this, but for everybody else, one of our dear friends and collaborators, Dick Gewertz, is yeah. doing a session on heart rate variability, and he'll talk a little bit more about that. And we're getting so many great questions. So I want to Please, everyone's minds to know that we won't be able to cover all of this right now, but I will be downloading all of the questions and sharing them with Dr. Porges so that we can get his feedback at a time that's comfortable and appropriate. We know he sits on the porch and does a little bit of writing, <laughs> so I know we will be able to do that. Uh, I know I will get in so much trouble if I don't ask you um, two more questions specifically, and one is... Um, this idea of vagal tone or vagal training and mm -hmm. what we can do to actually improve our vagus nerve regulation. Well, uh, the latter term you use, I like the best, vagal, uh, vagal regulation. Mm -hmm. um, because when we start using word vagal tone, even though I use this early in my research, yeah. it's ambiguous to people who are not in the area. Mm -hmm. Basically, we're not toning a nerve. We're enhancing how the brainstem is regulating the the end organ through the nerve. In most cases, we're looking at certain components of heart rate variability as our monitor of how that neural system is working. So we're using heart rate variability not as a measure of cardiac function, but as a measure of the brainstem's regulation of the heart, i.e. vagal tone. Right. And when we see that greater vagal tone to the heart, it's kind of a index of a more global homeostatically functioning autonomic nervous system. So if you have low vagal tone to the heart, your body in a sense is primed to be more mobilized, more uh, with a lower threshold to be more sympathetically aroused or reactive, basically to go into fight flight states very easily. Mm -hmm. But intuitively you would see that in people uh, with low heart rate variability. I would say that I would give you another set of clues because it's very hard to estimate a person's heart rate variability by looking at them. Right. But it's not hard to estimate their heart rate variability by listening to them. Mm. Because the intonation of voice is through a vagal pathway as well. And so we're, we gravitate to people whose voices have intonation. We feel safer. We move towards them. A mother's melodic lullaby is your example. But even a male voice, if it has prosody, becomes attractive and more comfortable with. And basically, that's coming through vagal pathways. Mm. So, so vocalizations are really a clue uh, for us. But I'm also going to say that our nervous system or our neuroception knows that. We, don't, we just have to uh, acknowledge it, that our physiology will change state when we're engaged with a person whose voice is prosodic. But if their voice is higher pitched or lacks prosody, we sense that tension and our bodies become tense. And we get confused because we think the information is conveyed in the words. The words are, in a sense, important, but more important is how the words are expressed. So beautiful. So you guys who are wanting more tips and tools and what works and all of that, the lectures, we're going to share the link to talk a lot about that. And so breath and um, sound, but also our own voice and chanting mm -hmm. and singing and humming. And I know you talk a lot about that in your lectures as well. Um, I'd like to get to one more question and it kind of ties in with that sound. And it is, I'm, I'm involved, I'm actually on the board right now for a group called the Association for Applied and Therapeutic Humor. So we mm. study humor and laughter. You did say a funny thing and I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to ask about this. So what do you think about kind of humor and laughter and the role that plays in safety? 
Well, I'm not sure. Uh, well, I think that's wonderful. But I will throw back at you one simple thing is what do you think is the root of humor? Where does it come from? Well, there's a few things I think about with that. And I look at laughter and humor different. So I think laughter is a non-conscious cue of safety. Mm -hmm. So if you hear mm -hmm. someone laugh or you, you laugh, it's, mm -hmm. it's safe. But I also think that a lot of humor comes from things where there's a disruption or a, yeah. almost a pattern that's broken that we don't expect. And there's that. Right. Kind of so uh, our nervous system craves predictability. It's a metaphor for safety for a nervous system. Mm -hmm. Now, humor is all about violation of expectancy. But it's violation of expectancy in a safe, contained environment. Right. Okay. If you take the safe, contained environment away, the violation becomes threat. Yeah. So everything has to do with the features of safety. And our nervous system likes disruptions because it likes to solve problems, it likes to fill in gaps. But everything has to do with, are we in a safe container uh, that enables us uh, to have enough resource to exit the safe environment to explore. So we see the paradox in life that boldness is really a product of being safe. So if, yeah. if you if you have accessibility to co-regulation, you then become a self-regulatory regulatory individual. So you have a place to go back to, but you can go away and you can explore the world. Think of that on a developmental level. And then maybe we would not be so upset with our children. So in a sense, we may understand what the intuitive innate motivation is in their exploration and in their need to come back and be held. So speaking of humor and finding things funny, I'm gonna give a shout out again to my friend, Monsi, who is here. She's one of our uh, certified stress mastery educators as well. And she said to ask you if you used the Zoom fix my appearance feature because last night I shared because people are saying I look so much better and I'm, my health is getting better and I said there's a button next to your video and you click it and it says fix my appearance so oh, she wow. was asking maybe that's why you look so great did you know oh, about no. that no where's the button <laughs> <laughs> that's what everyone said that is worth the price of admission I mean it's free no, I know. Well, <laughs> with zoom you can change the background because when I talk to my granddaughter sometimes I talk from outer space that's uh, awesome. But I hadn't uh, played with fix fix myself, so I will. Well, just I, so you know, you look as if you knew where that button was. That was <laughs> the point, and I'll I'll tell you later how to find it. You don't need it. Um, so as we're getting ready to wrap up again, I'm so grateful, and we have more comments and questions, and we will download all of those. So I have a question for those of you who are joining live. It's actually a little favor that I think will help all of us, and then I have a closing question for you, Dr. Porges. So for those of you who are with us live in the chat box. I want you to type in the one thing, if you can limit it to one, that had the biggest impact on you in this conversation or what landed with you the most. What's the big aha or takeaway? Because I'm going to be looking at those. I'm going to share those with our speakers because I know how helpful that is if you're teaching something to know what's landing. But also it will help us as we continue to have discussions over the next couple of days. Um, for you, Dr. Porges, I would just love to know what you're working on now, what you're excited about, and where people can get more information. And again, keep in mind, we will link to all of this for you guys who are watching. Well, you can go to my webpage, which is stephenporges.com, and I'm working on this Traumatic Stress Research Consortium, which is really has a goal of conveying uh, the documentary of what it is to experience trauma, because I feel that that information has been so distorted in the world. And mm -hmm. I'm also very interested in the trauma histories of therapists who are working with trauma and their motivation. And mm -hmm. we have preliminary data on that. We have something like 700 therapists in the consortium, but I'd like to get a few thousand so that we have much better story. And then we're going to have them recruit some patients. So we end up with a few thousand patients to start mm -hmm. telling their story. So that's one thing, but life has always been interesting for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm working on uh, how polyvagal theory can transform the practice of medicine. I'm trying to build models of that. Right. We're trying to create uh, uh, opportunities of, for training in polyvagal theory. We've been discussing uh, 
the, the uh, organization of a polyvagal institute, which would be an educational one, because polyvagal theory is actually become generic in the world. Mm -hmm. And we have no, uh, we don't know if the information being conveyed by others is truly representative of the science underlying polyvagal theory. So we're trying to create a different model for that. I'm also, the other part which I'm really enjoying in life is there's another part of me, which is kind of an engineer. I like to invent, uh, I like to develop technologies. Mm -hmm. One of the technologies is the safe and sound protocol and that received the patent. And uh, what was also uh, approved in the patent, one of the claims, is the use of it or some type of other acoustic stimulation as an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator. Mm. So rather than uh, electrical stimulation on the ear or implants, it's basically using intonation of vocalizations to trigger that feedback loop. I am also working uh, on another uh, set of technologies and that, that has been approved by the patent office of extracting from physiological signals, neural components. So rather than talking about heart rate variability, we're talking about vagal influences to the heart or terms like I'm using now, like vagal efficiency. How effective is your vagus in regulating your heart rate? The relationship is not a constant. It changes when you change state. So when you're in different sleep states, your heart is more or less under the control of that part of the vagus that gets represented in the heart rate variability. So I'm actually monitoring that. And also I'm extracting physiological state from human voice. We've actually conducted a lot of research on this now, and that's also in, embedded in some of these patents. So the idea is that if you know the neural mechanism that creates uh, uh, intonation of vocalizations that signal safety, are those also the same ones that represent vagal activity and they tend to do that. And to close, what I really wanna say is where did this all come from? Uh, it came from an understanding and a, a journey of the evolutionary changes in the autonomic nervous system as an adaptive way for mammalian species to survive through co-regulation. So when mammals evolved, they, uh, their vagal regulation of their heart was linked to the nerves regulating their facial muscles. And what that meant was that they could convey their physiological state through their vocalizations, which we all know uh, when we have pets, we convey our physiological state to them by using a melodic voice. Mm -hmm. So it enabled conspecifics to come close together to feel safe with each other. And this is critical. And so we had both the ability to project our physiology in our vocalizations and to detect it through how our in this case, middle ear muscles work to pull out those sounds. So wow. it, it's a really, uh, it's a closed loop story, yeah. and which has methodology, technology, application, and theory. So, I mean, what else, I mean, what could be more fun? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so cool for so many reasons. And anyone in, in our community here, I'm sure is having this thought as well. And I just want to say thank you because when people hear what I'm excited about and working on, I always get the same thing where people say, well, I'm concerned about you. You're doing too much. Well, you can't say that anymore because did you hear what he just said he's working on? And it's, but it's the dance and it all fits and it's exciting. I know we just reconnected with Dr. Gordon and uh, yeah. Dick Verts and yourself and we're doing some things collaboratively, which are really exciting. I also have to say personally, um, I just found out a couple of days ago, I haven't made this announcement officially, but I am getting signed to do a new book that will be out next time, uh, this year, next year, this time. See, I'm flabbergasted even saying that, but it's on human adaptability. So you just gave me the best interview ever. <laughs> I'm so glad I will have this and I will be following up with you um, to ask you some more questions. So let me just share for a couple of moments um, what I'm seeing everyone share, and I love this. Uh, the most actionable explanation of compassion ever neuroception, compassion, we're seeing that a lot, neuroception, compassion, I want more, I knew you would. Uh, Stephanie, Dr. Peabody said, loves the concept of biologic rudeness, the perception <laughs> of, and the implications from, and so as I mentioned, she's uh, pioneering this amazing brain health initiative, and I know for a fact, 
we have a lot of people who are going to want to sign up for that trauma initiative. So myself included, uh, you're probably going to see a big uptick in signups. So hopefully someone's ready to tackle all of those emails. So just to to confirm that, I had um, trauma at indiana.edu. Is that correct? We should reach out to? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if they get too overwhelmed, we can consolidate that in a Google spreadsheet because I like doing that too. So we have a lot of great comments. Uh, Everyone, thank you for sharing those. And I will download those and share them with Dr. Porges. Um, So with that, thank you so, so, so much. What an absolute privilege and honor to spend time with you this morning. Well, well, thank you. And thank you for all the people who have joined us today to Uh, share our our dialogue. It's good to see you again. Stay healthy. Thank you so much. Yes. You too. And uh, next time we chat, it'll be from beach to beach. I hope so, yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Tell your wife I said hello. And you guys, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you again. For those of you who are live, we'll be live again at noon with our Healthy Humor panel. And I promise you are not going to want to miss this and you will definitely laugh. Um, So please join us. Okay. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.